all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. Hey there, welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry, a CW2 helicopter pilot type person from, wow, many, many years ago, 1968-69. want to welcome you to our program today. I've got, I think, some really great guests. Uh, uh, number one is Hope Hodge Sec, and she's going to be talking about the prepping for the next fight. And we're going to be talking about um, some of the major changes that the various services are going through and as they... You know, as they move into the future and look at different weaponry and, you know, recruiting and so on and so forth. So I think that's going to be really interesting. And in the second half of the program, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, universal service and uh, national service, that is. And I think you'll find that really interesting. Uh, it was an idea. Well, I mean, it's been an idea proposed forever. And um, as a result of the volunteer army, we know that the numbers have gone down as far as recruiting is concerned. And so this idea was first proposed by uh, Colonel Jack Jacobs, a Medal of Honor recipient, Vietnam veteran, back in uh, 2013. And we're trying to see if we can get some traction behind this. So we're going to be talking about Universal National Service in the second half of the program. And if you'd like to get in on the conversation on either end of the program, you can give us a call live at 734-822-1600. 734-822-1600. But before I get to my first guest, we have to thank our sponsors because we can't do this whole thing without sponsors. And uh, so we're going to start off with our longest serving sponsor, and that is Legal Help. For veterans, Legal Help for Veterans specializes in veterans' disability claims. For more information, you can go to their website, LegalHelpForVeterans.com, or give them a call at 800-693-4800. The National Veterans Business Development Council, better known as NVBDC, is the nation's leading third-party authority for a certification of veteran-owned businesses. For more information, you can go to their website, that's NVBDC.org, or give them a call at 888-237-8433. That's 888-237-8433. If you are a small veteran-owned business and you want to do work, uh, get contracts with the federal government, you need to be certified as a real live veteran-owned business. And these are the folks that will do that for you. So check them out. That's uh, nvbdc.org. The Charles S. Kettles VA Medical Center here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For more information about the uh, Charles S. Kettles VA Medical Center, just go to va.gov slash Ann Arbor Healthcare. And, of course, we'd also like to thank our longtime sponsors, the Irwin Prescorn American Legion Post Number 46 and the Charles S. Kettles Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 310, both of Ann Arbor, Michigan. If you would like to become a sponsor, all you got to do is, Go to veteransradio.org and click on the sponsorship button. We're more looking for more and more sponsors if we can. Uh, we can't do this for free. So we're trying to, you know, gather the funds to pay for the various affiliates that we are on and equipment and so forth. If you would like to donate to Veterans Radio, since we are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, corporation, again, you can go to the website, veteransradio.org, and click on the donate button. Now we're kind of a a little thing we're trying to do this year since this is our 20th year is 20 bucks for 20 years. That's a pretty good deal, I think. So uh, go and click on that button and we would greatly appreciate your support. All right, let's get right into our program right now. My guest is uh, Hope Hodge Second. She is a writer on military issues. She's based out of Washington. Now, for those that have watched the Veteran Radio or listened to Veterans Radio over the year, uh, Hope was on before when she was the managing editor for Military.com. Uh, her previous assignments have included a war zone embedded in Afghanistan with the Marines, multiple reporting trips aboard amphibious ships and aircraft carriers. Her awards include multiple North Carolina Press Association honors, the 2015 and 2017 Marine Corps Heritage Foundation Heinel Awards. <laughs> just, you know, just a great writer, and this is an expert a real expert on what's going on in the military today. 
So Hope, welcome back to Veterans Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, when I got my my magazine, um, the magazine that I'm talking about right now is from the um, Military Officers Association of America. It's their um, magazine. And on the, on the very cover, I'm sorry we're not doing this with video, but we should. It says, prepping for the next fight. Find out what's in store this year for our uniform services. And uh, we're going to talk about all the services a little bit today. I hope you don't mind. And uh, how did you come about writing this article? So I love working with Military Officer Magazine. I write for a lot of different outlets, but they are one of my favorite clients because they are very forward looking when it comes to how best to serve the military and veterans community. And in fact, they have, I was just looking it up now, I think uh, 360,000 members in Military Officer Association of America. So this is a regular feature they do where they take a look forward at what matters most to the different military services, uh, both for operational things, equipment, Uh, deployments, but also really practical things like pay and benefits and health care. So this is a regular feature, and I was really honored to do it for them. Well, it's it's a really interesting article for one thing. And and I, you know, with all the turmoil that was involved with that particular senator who didn't want to let the, um, you know, the newest commanders of all the various branches of the service get through this committee, Everybody seemed to hit it all at the same time in November, I think it was. And so let's start off with the Army. So I'm looking here as the Arctic, the Army really is, is mostly a concern, it looks like, with, with radical recruiting overall. Their numbers are so down. That's right. And the Army, of course, that's the largest military service. So they tend to have you know, the things that all the services are struggling, they they have kind of the, the biggest proportion of. And uh, this past uh, end of the fiscal year, they missed their recruiting goal for a second time in a row on active duty accessions. And that's a big deal. Now, they are being really aggressive about how to get after this. And they've already rolled out some elements of what they're calling a recruiting transformation. Uh, They're looking at populations that they haven't reached as well as they could uh, in urban environments, in places in the U.S. that they haven't had as much of a reach as they would like to. Um, How to connect with the younger generation. The, the The interests and concerns of Gen Z are different from millennials, and those are certainly different from Gen Xers. And uh, this is a little peek into the future. I have it on good authority that the Army is about to roll out a whole new tranche of uh, recruiting initiatives in the next month or so here. So I don't have a lot of details on that yet, but that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Are you talking uh, incentives? You know, I would love to know (laughs) the details of that because everyone wants to know where the bonuses are. Mm-hmm. I have heard, though, uh, because, you know, I've, I've been in these conversations with recruiting officials. And in fact, we're going to do a deep dive in, on recruiting for Military Officer Magazine in an upcoming issue uh, that the services are aware that they can't just keep pouring incentive money at this problem. Bonuses are not the long term permanent solution. So I think you're going to see some more outside the box thinking. Yeah, I, w- I would think so. And I, I know that in in the article you were talking about that they're doing this this test program. I think it was down at was it Fort Jackson, South Carolina. That's right, where they take these recruits who are not quite up to Army spec, and you'll hear all of the services and certainly at the Army saying we're not lowering standards. We're we're not going to change the bar but taking recruits who might be able to make that bar, but are not making it already, whether it's on height and weight, whether it's on academics and saying, we'll coach you, we'll bring you up to standard. And so far that's been a pretty successful effort on the part of the army. So they're looking to build on and expand that. I think that sounds, that's, that's really interesting that um, sort of like uh, minor leagues or for a sport, you know, exactly. or, or you're going to some of these sports, uh, sport training schools that they have out there because you, you know, you're not quite fast enough or you're not quite tall enough or you're not 
whatever it is. And then they build you up and then you can take that next step, you know, into the program. I think that sounds like a cool idea. Yeah, it's like an army farm team. You've got yeah. the to do the yeah. Rocky montage, <laughs> getting ready for yeah, the fight. They're, 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 yeah, and plus maybe they, I'm sure they must get paid while they do that. Uh, yes, uh, that's that's my understanding. It's kind of like a, you know, a, a pre boot camp. Yeah. Oh boy, I can hardly wait to do that again. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. So you also mentioned in the in, in the uh, article about the army. Uh, their new combat vehicle, this M10 Booker. Yes. So this has been uh, about a decade in development, and we're finally seeing some some action on turning it into a reality. Now, Army combat vehicles in general, they uh, or any military service, these things don't move fast. And, and even even the, the relatively rapid uh, progress is, it takes years. Uh, something interesting to, to look at that goes beyond the scope of the story is the various services are looking at ways to integrate um, hybrid and electric technology. So I don't know if you'll you'll see that directly for the Booker, but they're uh, considering the options there and certainly looking ahead to to future combat vehicles. It sounds like a really kind of a cool vehicle. It's a it's a kind of a mini tank. Um I'm, t- I'm reading from the article here. We're we're talking with Hope Hodge uh, sect who wrote this article, and I'm just I'm, I thought it was so cool because the, the Booker is named after a Medal of Honor recipient, a Private uh, Robert D. Booker who died in World War II, and a Distinguished Service Cross recipient, St- Staff Sergeant uh, Stefan Booker, who unfortunately passed away from his injuries in Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I didn't get a chance to look it up and go, "Geez, are these guys related? I I don't know if they are or not. I'll have to." have to check it out but it said that it looks it looks like a smaller uh, abrams tank with its tracks and a 100, 105 millimeter gun turret i think that might stop a few people <laughs> along the way substantial firepower in the fight yeah but i think that that's kind of cool and, and so for those of you that are listening and want to find out more about it just go you know type into google m10 booker see what it, you know what comes up with it. it's kind of a cool picture of what it looks like it's in in the magazine um so moving on from the army let's go to the marine corps which i thought was really interesting in that the marine corps is, is kind of transitioning away from their own their tanks and uh, focusing more on um i don't know it sounded like what's the word i'm looking for i just forgot it uh, age-related <laughs> problems come along every <laughs> once in a while more individual training and not mm. you know, not, not utilizing the um you know the tank a- aspect of it that's right well the marine corps is officially tank free as a service they've, they've divested of all of their tanks and they are looking to get lighter and leaner and this has been a subject of some controversy on Capitol Hill. There okay. are certainly folks, and particularly in the retired ranks, retired general officers, who say the Marine Corps is changing too much, too fast, uh, getting rid of infantry components, various capabilities. But the Marine Corps is looking forward to that future fight, and they want to be able to send small units uh, for island hopping operations in the Pacific to be able to operate independently when they can't get quick resupply. Uh, they, they want, you know, they want to transport on Ospreys and vehicles that can fit inside Ospreys. And they're, they're really looking at creative ways to sustain that kind of light, agile fighter. And the Marine Corps, as I'm sure you know, is very, very concerned about its own identity as a separate mm-hmm. capability from the army as something that no other service offers as kind of this hybrid amphibious force that it's always been. And this is, is the picture that they've come up with. And there it's now a couple of commandants uh, who have kind of sustained this vision and it is moving forward into the future. Well, you, you, in, in the article, it, you talk about them and see, seemingly concentrating more on the South Pacific part of the world and, you know, let, I guess letting the army take care of army and the rest of them take care of the Middle East. But it, it, 
is, is this something that is, is part of this overhaul of the Marines? Absolutely. And the, the Marine Corps will tell you that some of the biggest potential future fights, future adversaries are right there in the Pacific. You think about China, which is a, a technological and geopolitical threat and uh, increasingly very capable investing in its military capacity. And then there are unstable actors out there like North Korea. So even though the Middle East continues to uh, pop up as a center of uh, conflict, as we've seen even recently, the, the Marine Corps is making a big bet that the future sort of of the big near peer power struggle is going to be in the Pacific. Yeah, we've had we've had guests on uh, Veterans Radio recently that talked about that. That's that's an area we really need to concentrate our attention on because mm-hmm. um, it's 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 pretty a dangerous area. I mean, so many parts of the world are dangerous right now, but the, you know this is something that could potentially cause us problems in the in the not too distant future. Right. Um, you know, in, in talking about not, not just the Marine Corps. So the Navy, this is this I found was really interesting. So we've got the Navy with the first female top officer um, ever, uh, Admiral Lisa uh, Franchetti. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she's in charge of the whole deal. That's pretty That's cool. Right. That's right. And uh, she comes with some impressive bona fides. You know, she's she's been out in the fleet. She's you know, commanded sailors underway at a very high level. Uh, and in in general, she's just an impressive sailor to serve under. So as you uh, mentioned or alluded to earlier, there was this lengthy hold on uh, on nominations of uh, officers for promotion. She was part of that. So. Uh, her ascending to the position of uh, chief of naval operations was somewhat delayed, but she's now in place and the Navy is leading the way. They are leading the way. And they're, well, you know, you, we mentioned earlier on that there are uh, things going on in the Middle East and, you know, on the, around the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and so forth. And there are two Navy carriers there right now. Um, the, uh, Listen, we got we got the Gerald R. Ford and the Dwight D. Eisenhower are, are there, and I'm, and I'm sure that many of those retaliatory flights are uh, taking off from those aircraft carriers. Not only that, so that was a very very fast uh, response from the Navy, and on behalf of the whole Defense Department, the Navy was sort of the forward arm of that response uh, following the October seventh attacks by Hamas on Israel to get out into the med, to have a carrier presence, to say we are here and we are responsive and we are at the ready. Uh, Since even that, sort of that story that I put together at the end of the year, we have seen the Navy be a very prominent uh, actor uh, in in defense. So there are a number of Navy ships, uh, destroyers and, and cruisers that have very, very successfully uh, blocked, defended, and returned fire against uh, Houthi rebels out of Yemen, who are, uh, to as best we know, uh, acting on behalf of Hamas in sending out missiles toward Navy assets. Uh, so, so the Navy has acquitted itself very, very excellently so far, has just demonstrated its ability to maintain uh, dominance in this area and to uh, respond as needed. I think it's really, it's always, you know, concerning, I guess you could say to me, you know, as people, you know, that prod us, you know, and you're prodding us with, and we've got the biggest stick, I guess you could say, out there. and. You know, and, and from a political standpoint, you know, we I, I guess it, I guess it comes down to you know it's, we have to be careful because we don't want to you know have this whole thing erupt into World War Three or or anything along those lines, but we still can't allow you know these these, these small groups you know that are being uh, you know supported by other or uh, you know other 
uh, states to, um, you know, hold up trans, you know, hold up the, um, the business of transferring goods, you know, through the Suez Canal or, or through the Red Sea and so forth. And I think that all of these small little um, organizations that, you know, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to take on an aircraft carrier or a, or a destroyer or anything along those lines, because you know that you have to know that, that they're going to retaliate and they're going to retaliate three times, 30 times over what you can do. That's right. The Navy uh, always wants to maintain overmatch. And that yeah. goes for all of the services, but yeah. they're, they're the power in the seas, no doubt. Well, yeah. I mean, we go all the way back to the Roosevelt with the big stick thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. So we're moving, like, trying to move along. I don't want to, I don't want to lose you when I, while we're talking. So, oh, oh, I know. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was the ghost fleet. The ghost fleet. Yes. Yeah. So this is really wild. Um, you know, the, the Navy, uh, not unlike the Air Force with this boneyard, has uh, a number of ships that are always, uh, that are sort of in this, this in-between area where they've been, they're out of commission but they're, they're not uh, in, in the scrap heap yet. And so uh, it, proposals every once in a while come up to say, hey, can we reactivate uh, some of these ships and add, add to our numbers? And, and the Navy uh, for uh, several years now has been very, very preoccupied with how many ships do we need in our overall fleet? And what is that number and how do we get to it? Uh, because Building ships in the shipyard is uh, very cost intensive, but even more than that, very time intensive. And there are a limited number of shipyards to draw from. And so building more ships, adding to the fleet faster than the Navy can retire old ships mm -hmm. has been um, just a, a really difficult problem for, for the Navy for a while. Um, so that's where this kind of concept comes from. I just thought that was interesting. Ghost, ghost fleet is like was yes. floating around out there some long, you know, with the pirate ships and so forth mm -hmm. that were out there. But it sounds like they're they're trying to upgrade these ships without building new ones. Exactly, exactly. That's a that's a proposal on the table. I'm not sure where it will go. Um, another thing uh, to pay attention to is the Navy uh, building unmanned ships. So they're, they're cheaper, they tend to be smaller, but if you can uh, predict their, their movements, make sure that you, they're, they're capable and, and you're controlling them, uh, that's a way that the service is also pursuing to build out its fleet to the desired number. That's kind of interesting. It's sort of like the pizza guys in our town with, with their robot delivery vehicles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, trying to see how that works. All right. I, that's, that's cool. I like that. All right. So we got the Navy and, and they're sort of increasing their uh, special ops training. And one of the, the things in the article, we are, as I mentioned before, we're talking with um, Hope Hodge Sect. Her article is in the, the Military Officers Association of America's magazine um, called The Military Officer Never Stops Serving. And she's kind of taking a look at each of the military services and what we can anticipate for the upcoming year. So we've gone through the Army and Marine Corps and the Navy. Now let's go to the Air Force. And the Air Force is uh, increasing their special op training where they're holding training exercises with the Army's 160th Special Operations Aviation Unit. And those are the guys that take the SEAL Team 6 people around on their missions. And so it sounds like that the Air Force wants to get more involved in that. Yeah, a very, very exciting concept. I always am interested personally when I see the services looking for opportunities to be what you might call joint. Mm -hmm. I, I think very often they get siloed. So they are uh, reinventing the wheel or doing the same thing uh, in, in kind of different colored iterations. But I also believe that uh, this, this kind of combined effort is reflective of what they're anticipating for the future fight, which is um, opportunities for the services to uh, to lean on each other's capabilities 
and to to draw on what's available. Again, as we were talking about with the Marine Corps, looking to operate in sort of austere uh, areas where there's not a fancy base with a KFC inside. Um, you know, you, you have things where uh, the Air Force might be using uh, Army assets uh, or, or vice versa. Uh, another piece of the overall Air Force vision puzzle is what they call agile combat employment. Again, they've been rolling this out over uh, the last few years. And again, that's the ability for uh, aircraft and squadrons to sort of um, bunny hop to austere areas like the Pacific, use the available resources, whether they belong to the Army or the Navy or what have you, and uh, and deploy force in kind of like a, a hub and spoke way to to reach further out with their power. Well, it's, it sounds certainly it sounds reasonable, and I, I would think it'd be very cost effective. Is you know if they're working together on some of these things, I know there's duplication as far as uh, weaponry and so on and so forth. But if you know, for instance, if the Marines can't don't have enough people somewhere, then the Army could add to it, or the the Air Force could come in before the Navy has the opportunity to get their planes on station. Types of things. I think that's really. Uh, really kind of a very, really efficient. And the other thing that the Air Force is doing that you mentioned is that they have a new uh, a new jet coming out. Um, what is it? The sixth generation fighter is taking shape, replacing the F-22 Raptor. Can you tell us a little bit about what's coming out with that? Uh, yes. Yeah. So this is the NGAD, the, the next generation air dominance. And uh, this is the 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 exciting new thing now uh, I feel like I say this a lot and have already said this but these these uh, efforts are years in the making and we sort of get little scraps and and pictures of what these uh, next capabilities might be uh, but we don't yet have a sixth generation fighter aircraft anywhere in the U.S. military. There have been only two fifth generation fighters. There's the F-35, uh, which the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps have. And there's the F-22, which was um, a, a which is an Air Force program uh, that was cut short in terms of production. So there is a limited number of F-22s. Now, when you talk about the capabilities for, you know, the kind of the next level Air Force fighters. Uh, it's it's a lot less of sort of like the the dog fighting maneuvers that we think about with uh, you know Tom Cruise and and, and Top Gun and and his F uh, fourteen Tomcat and it's much more about being networked in the sky. So uh, you have just an unprecedented view of the battlefield and everything in it, and everything is talking to each other, and you can sneak up on the enemy uh, well before they're they're aware that you're in the area. I think one of the things that, that kind of, you know, attaching to that is to talk a little bit about what the Space Force is up to with their, you know, I didn't want to leave them out. Uh, the space, <laughs> you know, is that they're focusing, it says, on positioning, navigation, time, and electromagnetic warfare. Ooh, big word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the Space Force is fundamentally different than any other service out there. And they're leaning into that. You recall that they uh, date back only to December of 2020. So they just passed their three-year anniversary, three-year birthday. And they are, they don't have a lot of, uh, well, you know, they, they, they're not <laughs> deploying to space. They've got mm -hmm acquisition folks and uh and satellite controllers it's highly technical um and yet this is becoming an increasingly important part of warfare is just maintaining dominance in in space and in sort of the the electromagnetic realm and everything that we can't see so you're still seeing the space force looking for different ways to organize that makes sense mm -hmm. for for its specific needs and for the its specific mission which is unlike any of the other services 
You know, I, I think it's just, you know, and, and based on what we were saying about, you know, the Navy is trying to figure out where everything is. And then you got the space forces above them and they could be working with all the different branches of the service and saying, OK, the bad guys are over here. And, you know, they have the ability to direct you toward wherever the action might be. Correct. Yeah. OK, finally, I'm going to I need to get into the Coast Guard a little bit. This is my <laughs> yes. father's branch of the service. And it's not that they have a whole lot of things that are going on, but they do. This is the Coast Guard. And then this was something I didn't know before. The only service that can work in ice locked waters. And they now they're they're getting a new icebreaker. Yes, this is uh, at long last. And not many people know this about the Coast Guard. And I'll, I'll shout out to my father-in-law, who is also a career Coastie. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the Coast Guard is the only service that possesses this icebreaker capability. They've got uh, two icebreakers, the, the Polar Star and the Healy. They're both incredibly old, should have retired a long time ago, and are more and more difficult to, to keep up and, and keep moving through uh, the ice. And at the same time, uh, these these ice locked kind of uh, Arctic northern waters are more important than they've ever been before, uh, because you've got competition from Russia, you've got competition from China. Uh, there are folks in that space who who haven't been as interested before, who are trying to claim it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for for their power. So so the Coast Guard, uh, this uh, I think they call it the the Polar Security Cutter. Um, it's been, they've been fighting for funding for it for a long time. Uh, it's moving forward in, um, in a really healthy way. The, I think the design is, is finalized and they're, they're getting the money that they need. Um, so, so this is great news for the service. And it's been, I, I think if there's been anything that, that the Coast Guard has been asking for on Capitol Hill uh, for the last few years, it's, it's for this, this polar security cutter to be what they need it to be. I, I, I think just go. This is a great article, folks. Uh, I, I encourage you. I don't know where we could find it online. I suppose, I suppose you could probably find it somewhere out there. I'd have to look for it. I mean, I, I'm a member of this organization, so that's how I come. I got the magazine. <laughs> uh, we, we we have been talking with with uh, Hope Hot Sec, and there's there's a couple of other services that unfortunately we don't have time to go into. And I I would love to have you come back and talk a little bit. Uh, more about the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and finally, the U.S. Public Service. I don't think people are aware of these uh, branches of the service. But I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us here on Veterans Radio today, and keep writing these great articles. Hope uh, you know you're a. It's 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 great to have somebody that can explain these things to people like me and to many people in our audience. There's so many things that are going on. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. So that's hope. And uh, now we're going to go on to, to another story, but first we're going to do our medal of honor. And when we come back from our medal of honor segment, we are going to be talking with Bill Graham, a Marine uh, of my generation of a Marine and he's going to be talking about the case for universal national service. This is going to be kind of interesting, folks. So you're listening to Veterans Radio, and we will be right back. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. First Lieutenant Jack Jacobs, although seriously wounded, made repeated trips across an open rice paddy, evacuating wounded and their weapons. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. Jacob served as an assistant battalion advisor in Kien Phong Province, Republic of Vietnam. The battalion was advancing when it came under intense heavy machine gun and mortar fire. Jacobs called for and directed airstrikes on the enemy positions. Due to the intensity of the enemy fire and heavy casualties to the command group, including the company commander, the attack stopped and the friendly troops became disorganized. Wounded by mortar fragments, Jacobs assumed command of the company, ordered a withdrawal from the exposed position, and established a defensive perimeter. 
Despite heavy bleeding from head wounds that impaired his vision, Jacobs returned under intense fire to evacuate a seriously wounded advisor to safety, where he administered life-saving first aid. He then returned through heavy automatic weapons fire to evacuate the wounded company commander. Jacobs made repeated trips across the fire-swept open rice paddies, evacuating wounded and their weapons. On three separate occasions, Jacobs drove off Viet Cong squads who were searching for allied wounded and weapons, single-handedly killing three and wounding several others. His actions saved the lives of a U.S. advisor and 13 allied soldiers. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative. Maybe it's you. Even the toughest among us sometimes need help, but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. If you know a veteran in crisis, don't wait. Reach out. Call the Veterans Crisis Line at 988, then press 1. 988, press 1. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And we're back here on Veterans Radio, and my guest coming up is uh, Bill Graham, and Bill is a um, Marine, Vietnam era Marine, and I'm anxious to talk to Bill to about the idea of this case for universal national service. So, Bill, welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, thank you, Dale. Thanks for having me. Well, it's 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 uh, good to have you on the, on the program. Uh, just for our audience's sake, I found Bill because I've actually started. To, I was trying to get caught up on reading all of these magazines that we get for these various organizations that some of us are in, and that's where I found um, my last guest, Hope. Uh, this one is comes from the um, November December issue of the VVA Veteran Magazine. And in it, there, there is the article. It's called The Case for Universal National Service. And, Bill, I guess you were asked to write an article about this. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, you, what I did was uh, back in, uh, in 2013, I wrote an article and never sent it any place. Uh, and it, I, <clears throat> I just put my thoughts on paper after having seen, uh, uh, ironically, uh, Colonel Jack Jacobs on uh, CNN one day and and he was talking about uh uh mandatory service and and, and that uh he did not think that the selective service uh uh you know the, the selective service program we we now have uh should be activated uh, again uh in that it had too much selectiveness uh as part of it <clears throat> and i think that was born uh, out during the vietnam era uh, that uh, it became too selective. <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, talking to our, uh, many of our listeners and, you know, in our age group, um, you know, we had, a, we had a number of options we could enlist. Yeah. That was number one. Um, we could get drafted. <laughs> um, if we were still in college and some other ways we could, we could uh, defer our, our, our entry into the service and the worst case scenario is the guys are in, went to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend from high school. I think he's still with her. I don't think he ever came back. But <laughs> the idea being is that it the the argument in, in your article is that it was a disproportionate number of people from lower incomes and, and so forth that were getting caught up in the draft because they didn't have the means to get deferred. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, so many people, uh, uh, it, it just, uh, uh, yeah, they did multiple tours of duty in, in combat zones. And, and, uh, and we didn't realize the effect all that had until years later when the post-traumatic stress uh, and the uh, uh, became, you know, really at the forefront and suicide rates began to really, really uh, skyrocket. And uh, and that that's when it really comes to the surface, and we have to uh, to examine it. And uh, and selective service, I don't think uh, I agree with uh, Colonel Jacobs, is, and I don't think it's it's the answer. And I think uh, personally, I believe that the answer lies in in uh, in service, and uh, whether it be. Uh, 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 the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, or the military service. 
I, 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 I agree. I mean, I, I can remember, uh, you know, having discussions even when I was in the service sure. um, about, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we become more inclusive? How do we get more people to understand that, you know, it's, it's not just being in the military that's serving the country. We need other ways that we, we need to be aware of what this country provides for us. You know, exactly. kind of like a, you know, John Kennedy type of thing. Yeah. And that, you know, it doesn't necessarily, not everybody's cut out to be in the military. Right. <laughs> we know that too. I agree with that. <laughs> but there are so many different options that are, that are available. Um, <clears throat> you know, as you mentioned, the, the Peace Corps, the AmeriCorps, you know, Teaching for America, uh, Conservation Corps and so forth. And I, I, I think what was in, in, in the article was implied is that everybody, and, and, and we're talking everybody, men and women that are physically able to participate, would, would donate two years of their lives mm-hmm. to the country. Either two years in the service or what the other things that we mentioned there. And at right. the end of that two years... If you want to stay in, you can stay in. You want to get out, there probably would be some sort of GI Bill uh, available to them. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, in reading the uh, the AmeriCorps and, and Peace Corps have a, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a stipend at the end of that that will help re- reintegrate yourself into whatever field you want to go. <clears throat> and... Uh, and I and uh, there's a a payment program while you're engaged in that, rightfully so. You're not become uh, a millionaire <laughs> by doing that, but but you will be able to uh, to contribute to the country uh, that we call the United States of America that so many people want to come to, and and, and we can uh, and we can d- uh, reduce the divide between us and them, the civilian sector as opposed to the military sector. And uh, and the, the two can meet and uh, and become uh, our the country we want to be. I I, I agree with you, Bill. And I think it's uh, you know when we've got less than one percent of the population is in the military right. today, and there are a lot of people out there who don't have any connection at all to the military any longer, unless it was their great grandfather. Exactly. Yes. And <laughs> you know, so we've got to figure out. I think we have to make. We need to figure out a way to make people appreciate what we have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, politics aside, <laughs> we won't go into that. <laughs> but the, yeah. to, you know, that that we still, in, in my mind, you know, we're still the greatest country in, in the world, I think. Um, not not that other countries aren't great and so forth in their own way. But I mean, we're, we're still this this experiment. Which you know, I mean, we're we're the young kids on the block. I mean, what are we, two hundred and thirty some right. years old, and you know that we we're offering everybody the opportunity, and I think that's the magic word there is that opportunity to benefit from living here. Yes, and I think everybody should add a little bit to that if they are going to live here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and we we also have to, uh, as relates to the military. Uh, uh, get through to to, uh, to others that just because you join the military doesn't mean you're going off and shooting people, and, and that that is such a misnomer. And talking with uh, you know young folks uh, and those folks who have never joined, well, I don't want my kid to go off and and uh, and just be deployed and uh, and uh, and start shooting this and getting shot himself. There are so many opportunities. Uh, in the military, it's, it's mind-boggling, actually. And uh, and if we could get beyond those misnomers, uh, I think we would be, uh, you know, be able to uh, to fill the ranks in which they're having difficulty doing now, and uh, and at the same same time uh, fulfilling some of the social responsibilities that could be done uh, by not being in the military through the two-year commitment. Well, you know, the, the um, guest I had on earlier before we came on the air, I was talking with Hope, and she was talking about all the technology that's involved in all the branches 
yes of service you know it's not everybody just runs around as you mentioned you know carrying a rifle right there are, you know there are computer experts that 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 are in the field i mean these guys and you've talked to them as well you know they take computers with them out into the field right for, for communications for targeting for updates on weather and, and everything else that is sure. out there and that's not the only thing i mean you need they design the the, the weaponry they they deploy the weaponry you've got all these ships you know we and, and i wasn't in the navy but i know that there's a lot going on in a ship that, other than jets taking off from aircraft carriers that's right yeah that's that's so and even in the, the marine corps and uh, the marine corps you know has the reputation of well you can come from jail and grab a rifle and go to the marine corps well that's not true uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh uh and i can tell you my own story I started out uh, as a rifleman uh, in recruit after recruit training <clears throat> until it was discovered I knew how to type. <laughs> and it went on from there. Uh -oh. and that was 1960, and, and I spent my life, uh, my career in, in the personnel administration, and uh, doing well, things. So, you know, and that goes back to the thing about you know what is it that you need nine to ten administrative <clears throat> people or, or or support troops. For every one person in the field, sure. And again, not every one of those people, you know, is going to run around carrying a rifle or a pistol, yes. and 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 you know whatever that is. But you have to have those support people to do that. And the idea then is coming out when you come out of the service, you have skills, skills that you didn't even know you had. That's that, right. That are not related just to you know firing guns and rifles and so forth. Yeah, and, and you have a better appreciation for other cultures at the same time uh, because mm -hmm. you've been around other cultures. If you never leave your, your city block, that's, that becomes your world. Uh, and uh, uh, expand your horizons beyond that, and you, be, you begin to appreciate other things and other people. And, and, but it has so many pluses uh, to it and, uh, and fewer minuses. <clears throat> Well, I, I no, I I think so. You know, when when you when you look up look back at the all volunteer force that came about in 1973 as a result of the um, ineffective draft system that was that was going on at the time, um, you know, yes, it was great. Okay, everybody's a volunteer, but not everybody was in the game, and not everybody has you know, forget the terminology. You know, you don't have any money in the game, right, and so, you know, all we're, you know, we're all supportive of the troops that are overseas and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, food packages and so forth. But I, I think it's, it's so much more important, whether it's the military or the Peace Corps or any of these um, opportunities that these, these young people would have to just serve their country for these, for this two year time period. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, negotiations and compromises would, would allow them, you know, not necessarily, you know, it's, I think you're, you're, um, you want, oh, I see, here it is. It's requiring everybody between the ages of 20, 18 and 25. So if you wanted to go to college, you could get college out of the way and then put your two years in. Yes. And if you were, uh, I would say, uh, and it would be a, a proposal I would make if, if you were already, uh, registered for college, go to college, and you would put that two years on hold until such time as you finished uh, college, then spend your two years and go about your life. And, uh, and, uh, and you, you could reflect back upon the World War II, folks who came back and had put their lives on life, on, on hold for however long, and uh, carried on. Some became leaders of the country, others uh, leaders in the military, and went on with corporations. So it, it's not the end of things uh, by uh, spending two years uh, of your life uh, dedicated to service to the country. No, and I, and I think one of the things that, that's, uh, you know, that we're, we're talking about here with, with Bill Graham and uh, the case for universal national service is that if mm -hmm. everybody does it, yes. or if everybody participates in it, then there's no sense of loss by those who do do it. And I, exactly. this is just a personal story. I mean, I can remember, you know, I spent 
who counted, right? Three years, seven months, and two days <laughs> in, in the service. But when I came home, the, 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 the guys I had hung around beforehand who had gotten the deferments were now four years ahead of me career-wise. Sure. And that's something that I think that this idea is, is attempting to address. And I, I just think, I, I don't know, is there any, uh, is there anybody else talking about this other than, you know, a couple of years ago when you were, you, you know, what did you, you had, well, if the late Charlie Rangel of New York, he introduced that in 2011, I guess it didn't go anywhere. No, it didn't go anywhere. And then, and in, in uh, 2013, there was a, uh, a uh, house record uh, 748, the 113th Universal uh, National Service Act that was it was introduced and that was it. It died right there. So uh, you know it, it doesn't have a lot of a uh, lot of uh, traction, if you will. How but, do we uh, go about getting some traction? Do you have any any? Have you been able to talk to any politicians who might be willing to support this? I have not. Uh, no, it, it, it the the idea came up in uh, in the Vietnam Veterans uh, magazine, and uh, and uh, I said, well, I have some insight on this uh, that I'd researched previously, so I sent that out. And that that's what prompted uh, this interaction today. Mm -hmm. And but uh, I, I would certainly uh, not frown at uh, at going forth with a, a proposal to a congressional member. I think it'd be interesting to see if we'd find a congressional member that would support this thing. I yeah. You know, they have to be out there. I mean, there's still a couple of, there are still a couple of veterans that are serving in the, in Congress. Yes. And, and uh, yeah. And, and there are, uh, there, there seems to be more now uh, from Afghanistan and mm -hmm. Iraq era uh, uh, in, in the legislature now. So would, perhaps there is, yeah, you would think that they would be very interested in something like this, especially those men and women that did the five and six tours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh yeah. I, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine doing more than one tour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, five or six. I mean, obviously, that's going to add to the to the amount of post traumatic stress out there. It's going to add to the numbers of those twenty two a day suicides that are sure. are still going on. That's so we right. have to figure out a way to 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 fix this, Bill. And uh, yeah. anything that I can do to help you, I'd be more than glad to okay. get on the train with you and see if we can get this at least out of the station. Right. And I'll certainly keep you up to date on uh, any any uh, progress I make. OK, well, thank you very much. So we've been talking with Bill Graham, a uh, Marine from the Vietnam era and uh his article in the VVA, the veteran, was called The Case for Universal National Service. And mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to get an opportunity either read that article or, or go to our website, veteransradio.org. And we've got some information on how to get at these articles that we've been talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see what we can do. You know, what's your opinion? Do you shoot, what do you think? So shoot me an email. Let me know. We can have a uh, set up a, a group discussion on our program one day and talk about should the Universal National Service be something that we should be exploring. So again, Bill Graham, thank you very much for being on the program. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's, it's my pleasure. I love reading these. These there are great stories in all these magazines to all of our <laughs> listeners. Okay. So you know we encourage you to do that. Uh, next week, Jim Falson will be here and he's going to be uh, talking um, with a couple of veterans for uh, Black History Month. And we're going to be some other things like that along the lines. So this is Dale Thronberry for all of us here at Veterans Radio. Until next week, you are dismissed.
What's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.